Today we're talking all about emerging technologies. Elon Musk's Neuralink has surgically installed its first brain-computer interface in a human subject, with the goal of one day allowing paraplegics to telepathically operate smart devices. Apple launches its first mixed-reality headset, delighting and horrifying the masses as users step into the real world with computers strapped to their faces. AI girlfriends and boyfriends are officially on the market, but do they pose a real threat to human relationships? Today we talk all about the ethics of exciting new innovations and their impact on mental privacy. We also ask, is it time for a bill of neuro rights? We're really living in the future now. Imagine being completely paralyzed and suddenly gaining the ability to text, write emails, work, draw, create digital art, or even instruct a robot to help you get up and down the stairs. That's what Elon Musk's Neuralink could hold the key to. The company's first clinical trial is officially underway, and a human has received the first precise robotically implanted brain-computer interface from Neuralink. The implant, known as telepathy, is designed to interpret a person's neural activity so they can operate a computer or a smartphone just by thinking about doing so. The company is now recruiting patients to clinical trials who are quadriplegic, paraplegic, have vision or hearing loss, the inability to speak, and those who have suffered spinal cord injury, have ALS, or have had major limbs amputated. If successful, telepathy could completely revolutionize medicine and greatly improve the lives of people who are often overlooked in society. Yeah, so 2024, we got things plugging into people's brains, finally creating cyborgs. How do you feel about this? I'm excited. You know, I'm a tech optimist. Yes, there are ethical considerations. We're going to get into all that. But ultimately, I am pro-technology. I kind of liken these brain chips to a pacemaker that goes into your heart. Sure, with your brain, there's a lot more at stake here. But I find it fascinating. I think it could be really, really cool for helping people with who are paralyzed or have other disabilities. And also, it could potentially hurt our cognitive abilities, who knows? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be the first person that had to try this out. It reminds me of that clip from Robocop 2 where, you know, they're testing the cyborgs out and they come out and like, oh, on display for the investors and then it just like rips its helmet off and goes to skull. Yeah, I don't know that I would want to be the first, but then part of me would want to be the first so that I could be a pioneer. <laughs> well, I guess that's <laughs> what the guy was thinking that did it. Yeah. And truly, what do you have to lose if you you have more to gain, potentially, if you're already paralyzed and can't do much? I mean, sure, maybe you can think and all that, but maybe it's worth the risk. Well, yeah. Also, in RoboCop 2, they were taking, you know, cops that had been shot down in the line of fire, so they were, you know, not able to do anything else and turning them into cyborgs. Science fiction is always right. Of course, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit when I'm talking about RoboCop 2 and all the bad things. You know, I think it's great that we have the ability to help paralyzed people to be able to communicate again and move again and access the world again. But I mean, with any new technology, there are fears of it. Like it reminds me of that first season of Mad Men where the guy, they got a new computer in the office and he, he had a psychological breakdown because he was so afraid that this computer was, I don't know what. Get out while you can! Great show though. But like any technology, there are good things and there are bad things and both could happen with this, you know. Worst case scenario, your boss can text you in the middle of the night at 10 o'clock at night and like put an email right in your brain and tell you, you know, you got to get up and finish that TPS report or something. Peter, what's happening? Um, could you give me those TPS reports ASAP? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds horrible. <laughs> right. Or worse, other worst case scenario, an authoritarian government could track all of its citizens and be able to send you propaganda right into your brain. But before we get into more of that sort of terrible scenario, Black Mirror stuff, how does all this work? The implant is surgically installed in part of the brain that's responsible for planning movement. And the implant interprets a person's neural activity so they can operate a computer or smartphone by simply intending to move. The device wirelessly connects the user to an external device through an app, allowing the user to operate the computer without moving. So applications for this technology could be completely limitless. Neuralink aims to give autonomy to patients with severe paralysis and other neurological disorders. For now. But what if BCIs don't just allow us to connect to computers, but also allow computers to access us, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our brain activity? Brain-computer interfaces are not going to be restricted just for use in medicine. I am pretty sure of that. 
In the future, BCIs may be used for entertainment, in the office, and anywhere else, which raises questions about mental privacy and who owns our data. Companies today are notorious for mining our personal information. If they're literally inside our brains, they're going to own a whole lot of information, and we need to have a much bigger discussion about the ethics of neurotechnology and about possibly creating some sort of bill of neural rights. Oh, you're totally right. You just like proved it to me. Definitely this is going to happen. We're going to be getting ads for Carl's Jr. in our brains. Like every 30 minutes, a new ad's going to have to play in your brain. Yeah, not only will they play in your brain, you may get so many subliminal messages that you will be inclined to take certain actions like buying certain products, etc. I mean, we're already there now, but it's going to be really, really invasive. Yeah, yeah, you could really control people if you get inside their brain like 1984 really happen. We better make sure that we uh, send our society in the right direction. And this is an important time we're living in. <laughs> yes, it is. Like, if we don't do the right thing and the wrong people get in control, like, we're going to be really screwed in 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah, technology is increasingly taking us into Black Mirror territory. Apple just launched its Vision Pro Mixed Reality and VR headset, delighting and horrifying the masses as users step into the real world with computers strapped to their faces. People took their headsets to dinner, for a spin on the road, and to the streets to show off the next generation of immersive smart devices. The Vision Pro is a spatial computer that seamlessly blends digital content with the real world. I was personally super entertained by all these fun videos of using this device, and I really want one. I'm a little too vain right now to like go in public with this stupid goggles thing on my head and just like walk around. It looks really ridiculous. But this is going to change everything just as the iPhone did, and people are going to have to learn how not just to operate in the real world with it, but also to just exist and be subjected to seeing other people use it in the world, the real world. Yeah, I already saw three guys at my gym the other day that had it on and they were working out while using it. I guess there was some kind of virtual trainer that they were using. I don't know, I wanted to go up and ask them what was going on, but yeah, it's it all. It does look awkward in real life. It does look clunky, but you know, it'll get smaller eventually someday. It'll become just some glasses. So. Or just a microchip. Or just a, yeah, right. It'll be Neuralink at some point. So I'm really fascinated to see how this technology is going to impact the human brain. I did a story a couple years ago at UCLA and I interviewed some researchers who were doing ex an experiment on rats. They put these rats in a VR world and what they found was that the hippocampus shut down by 60% in VR. And the researchers believe this happened because virtual reality violates the laws of physics that the body knows in the real world, like gravity and the rats' brains basically adjusted to existing in another reality. So I'm sure something similar will happen with humans. The thing is, we don't have information or data right now, we don't have enough of it anyways, about how these technologies are going to impact our neurological functions. They could either help our cognitive abilities or hinder it or do a little bit of both. The hippocampus is the area of our brain that's responsible for our sense of space, and it's also crucial for learning and memory functions. So these are areas of the brain that are pretty important, and we want to make sure that we're not going to mess them up in some capacity by using this technology. Well, I know how VR affects my brain. Um, I've, I've done that, you know, not Vision Pro, but the other types of VR for video games. And But they were basic. Yeah, They're sure. not quite there like Oculus and like PlayStation. Sure, yeah, I know they're it's kind not of the same. I know the Vision Pro is a new technology and I do want to try it. But the other technology I tried a couple years ago made me so motion sick, I am afraid to put anything on my face. Yes, and I think people are experiencing that now with Vision Pro as well. But like you oh, said, really? it's going to get better and it's going to get more advanced and it is going to be even more seamless. Uh, so it's exciting and it's also terrifying. I'm I'm actually like, I was apathetic at first, but after watching some of the videos, now I'm kind of excited because I can see two possible applications, but it, this doesn't exist yet, but I know that it could exist. For video editing, it would be great if you no longer have to have the window in a little monitor, but you could have your timeline just spread across, you know, your whole reality. You could put your effects windows palette, your color palette, infinite palettes, you know, as far as you can look around in 360 degrees and edit like that, like Minority Report. And then I can come in and go, Tyson, I don't freaking like that edit. Change, 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 just like I do now, but I'm in your brain. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> or, yeah. You hear right. my voice or, haunting or you. Or you wear a Vision Pro 2 and we're both in there and like doing stuff. <laughs> so that could be cool. Another cool idea, they don't have this yet, but this is what I want. Imagine it's like Apple Vision Pro version 5. You could go play sports, like I go to stick time for hockey. And imagine that you could be out there skating in real life, 
but you could have a virtual goalie in front of you and you could be shooting at a virtual goalie or a whole team could be virtually playing with you. That's what I want this technology to do. When that happens, I will get one. I just want to travel the world more and be able to speak every language and talk to all the people in different countries and AI applications currently do this. So if you can have that on your face and go to Japan, go to Tokyo and just speak Japanese to people, that'd be so cool. We zijn er drie dagen geweest en we hebben vooral heel veel lekker gegeten uh, en we zijn naar een paar wijngaarden gegaan. Yeah, like Star Trek, yes. Universal Communicator. Yeah, I want it. I want it now and I will wear the stupid headset. <laughs> well, that, your wish will be granted for sure with that one. <laughs> I think the biggest downside, the thing that could be the possible Achilles heel of this technology is just the simple fact that people really don't like to wear something on their face. I mean, 3D movies didn't take over because the, just wearing something on your face just sucks. It's better to actually be able to look at it. These goggles right now, they only have a two hour battery life and then after that you get a horrible red mark around your face from wearing it. So. I don't know if that problem can be overcome, but we'll see. Yeah, it'll be overcome when Elon Musk makes a yeah. Neuralink brain chip, you know, Vision Pro. Or they just become a contact lens that you could just put in, maybe, and then it's not on your face. I mean, that'd be sick. Maybe that bridges the two, whatever. Yeah. AI girlfriends are flooding OpenAI's new store, despite the company's rules against GPTs dedicated to virtual companionship. Critics of artificial companions say the technology reinforces stereotypical gender roles and creates unhealthy attachments. Supporters say AI lovers reduce loneliness. Here's my favorite intimate health and relationship coach weighing in, Caitlin V, take a listen. AI girlfriends are here and they are everything you want them to be. But they're also, in my opinion, the single largest threat to single guys in the world today. They have the potential to ruin your chances of ever entering into a real, relationship with a human woman ever again. So she says that these relationships are shallow because you don't have any real emotional intimacy. There's no conflict. Your AI robot is basically just there to placate you and to give you whatever you want. And the thing about love is that it's a drug. It's addicting, even if it is artificial. And some people in the real world have gotten so obsessed with their AI partners that they have been unable to go to work or be present with their families. So we're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing in the future. Oh, you have a lot of contacts. I'm very popular. Really? Does this mean you actually have friends? <laughs> <laughs> You just know me so well. Man. Yeah, it makes me think that since I've been dating and single, I've met women who've told me about their past boyfriends, and a lot of them sound really terrible. Like, they don't know how to treat women right. And if a woman could get all of her needs met by an AI virtual boyfriend, it would just make the situation worse for the guy. Like, because then they would be getting their needs met. What's wrong with that, though? That's, that's what I, I know that the... This could potentially hurt human relationships, but what if you are able to have like the perfect AI boyfriend and then you can get your physical needs met in the real world with real men who you don't actually want to be with? What's wrong with that if it makes you happy? I don't know. Well, it would be like a her situation then where you have a virtual girlfriend who hires a sex worker to be the physical body for the virtual girlfriend. And I don't know, it, seemed, it was normalized in that. Future, yeah, so, so what's wrong with that? I don't know. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I get the pros and cons, but at the same time, I'm like, well, well, so what? I don't have a problem with it. It would be really funny though. You're like, hey, I'm bringing my boyfriend home for Christmas. And it's just like all your family has to put on Vision Pro to meet him because he's yeah. not real. Right. And then you hire just like some guy, like a worker that would be just eating the food for, for Thanksgiving dinner. I love this. I think it's hilarious. I'm sorry. He's not supposed to talk though because the AI boyfriend will talk over him. This is so funny. <laughs> then we can have whole AI families. Like, here's my AI kids. We'll see. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm Brigitte.